Um, so to give you just a brief history, although I assume most people are familiar with the history of MOOCs, but I'll just cover some of the basics, um, just so we're all on the same page. In 2008, in Canada, um, the course was CCK08. It was actually offered both as a university four credit course with students in there for students who took the course at the campus. But then they opened it up and allowed open enrollment. And they were trying to figure out what does this mean in terms of scaling, connecting, how does this change our, our education? This was the first MOOC, and they actually coined the name pretty soon thereafter. Now, their massive at the time was on the order of three to four, I think 5,000 students within these courses. But this group, uh, George Seaman, Stephen Downs, Dave Cormier, and there are others who were involved as well, they were creating these connectivist MOOCs. They basically took the attitude of the model of a central authority figure, a faculty teacher, disseminating information to students and then students reacting to the faculty, that doesn't scale. The real model they believed is the connections between the students. How do students work with each other and generate learning and knowledge by their interactions with each other? So this branch of MOOCs, the connectivist branch of MOOCs starting in 2008, have really been dedicated to sort of exploring that concept of how do you scale up and, and connect people. And there's a lot of papers and you know information behind it. Very important, very intriguing possibilities, but that's not the branch of MOOCs that's caused the change. Fast forward to 2011, and actually this was generated from Sal Khan. Sal Khan is the godfather of MOOCs, is the best way to think of this. Khan Academy, you know, was created just for his uh, nieces and nephews as he was uh, tutoring them as a you know, favor to family. Um, he's described that, you know, in the Bangladeshi community, extended families are important, supporting each other. So he was doing some tutoring. And then uh, I believe the story is his uh, nieces weren't available or he couldn't do it. So he made a couple of videos for them and uh, in the same tutoring that he did. He was a hedge fund manager, you know, completely different subject. He wasn't an educator. Well, then the student, his nieces said, I prefer the online version of you to you. <laughs> <laughs> and he also found that they actually were learning more from him once they went online. And he, at first he was insulted by this, but then he started thinking about the idea and he realized if they had a concept they didn't really get, there was no shame in just playing the video over and over again or practicing. There were no sort of dumb questions, dumb things. So he developed the Khan Academy just simply based on this interest in helping his family. But then as the idea started to get out, um, started growing and said, I'll just put it on the Internet. Then all of a sudden he's getting phone calls um, from like the Gates Foundation and from a philanthropist saying, well, you take $100,000 to do this. And it just sort of grew organically. He gave a talk at TED, the um, talks down in Long Beach, and Sebastian Thrun from Udacity, while well, he was at Stanford, and he's also the father of the self-driving cars at Google. So he and Port Peter Norvig, they both worked at Google, but they were both teaching at Stanford. They saw this TED talk and they were inspired and they said, why don't we take our artificial intelligence course and do the same thing? We'll just throw it online. And it was really driven. They had not worked with online programs. They didn't understand what work had gone before them, to, from what I can tell. But they saw this one thing and it inspired them. So they threw the course online. Um, it, you know, the stories become infamous, but you know, they didn't know what it would mean. They actually were videotaping the lectures and he does a lot of the same Sal Khan type thing of hand, you know, writing out equations and filming his hand. 160,000 students enrolled for that class, which the school was completely unprepared for. And it just opened up the floodgates. They very soon um, said, well, there's real value in online education. And then they ended up leaving and Sebastian Thrun and a partner started Udacity. Two other people at Stanford working on similar programs, uh, Daphne Kohler and Andrew Ng, they quit and they formed Coursera and this was all within a six month time period. And then all of a sudden we had these two companies. A lot of it was driven by, have to be honest, the New York Times coverage of it, because once they covered it, it sort of drove student interest. 
but there was a thirst for open education and for students to learn knowledge. Wasn't always college educated, uh, college age students, but non-traditional students. But from there, the Stanford branch, it created Udacity and Coursera by the beginning of 2012. And remind yourself again, that was just a year ago. Meanwhile, MIT had had their open courseware initiative. And then Harvard, I'm not quite sure what the connection was there, but MIT and Harvard decided to get into online education. And then they created edX as a joint investment where each school contributes $30 million to the development of it. Those are the big three players in MOOCs. And I've already pointed out the direct ties to the presidents and to the schools who were saying, we believe in online education, which I believe is triggering the change. Now, MOOCs are not self-sustaining at this point. Um, there's no revenue model. There's no self-sustaining way to bring in money either for commercial companies or even for the nonprofits like edX. Um, there's no official way to give to credential, whether it's badges or accredited degrees or course credits. That hasn't been solved yet. There's a lot of talk about course completion rates being very low, typically below 10% of students who register for a course complete it. And I'll address this a little bit later. And how do you know, particularly when you let have open enrollment, how do you know that the student is who they say they are? So there's some pretty significant challenges that MOOCs have to do to become self-sustaining. They haven't solved these problems yet, but they're out there and it's very significant.